Welcome to the Just Ingredients Podcast. I'm Cara Lynn, and here we talk all things nourishing to the mind, body, and soul. This is a place where you can find just good ingredients to life. The holiday season is over, but it is still candle season. Have you ever stopped to think about what ingredients are in a candle? Have you ever seen a candle with the ingredients on its label? Most likely you haven't. The Fair Packaging and Labeling Act gives fragrance manufacturers a trade secret status, so they legally do not have to share their ingredients with you. Synthetic fragrance can contain up to 3,000 different chemicals, some of which are endocrine disruptors and respiratory irritants. Some even contain chemicals that are known carcinogens. If you do not want to give up candles forever, I have a swap for you. I love Fontana Candle Company for their 100% natural and independently certified non-toxic candles, wax melts, and room sprays. They use only pure beeswax, coconut oil, and essential oils in their candles. And they put all of their ingredients right on the label. Fontana was the first candle to be certified non-toxic by Made Safe. I love that they have my favorite seasonal scents like cinnamon orange clove, peppermint twist, and spice latte. Use code podcast at fontanacandlecompany.com for 15% off your order. Again, use code podcast. Sarah Hanna Silverstein is the author of the book Moodtopia, Tame Your Moods, De-Stress, and Find Balance Using Herbal Remedies. She is a master herbalist, classical homeopath, board-certified lactation consultant, businesswoman, wife, keynote speaker, and mother of seven children. She is regularly featured on TV news shows across the U.S. discussing how people can integrate alternative medicine with conventional medicine. She is a consultant to many pediatricians, obstetricians, midwives, general doctors, and guest lectures to residents at medical schools. After working with over 235,000 clients for the past 20 years, She saw that most people needed help with their moodiness and created a program that teaches people how to be in control of your moods so they don't control you. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, I am really excited to bring back a guest, a guest that you guys really enjoyed and learned a lot from before. And so we invited Sarah Hanna back to the show to teach us more about herbs and how beneficial they are to the body. So welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be back. I'm a fan of yours and love following you on Instagram. Well, thank you so much. Will you just tell my listeners, maybe those that haven't listened to the previous episode that we did, just a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in studying herbs? Absolutely. So I'm what is called a master herbalist. And to become an herbalist, I did first a five-year classical homeopathic program then a three-year herbal apprentice program. I'm also an international board certified lactation consultant. So that was undergraduate, graduate work. I've been for the last 20 years in school most of my life. And I opened a woman in pediatric clinic because I saw that conventional allopathic Western medicine had a lot to offer. I love MRIs. I love blood tests. I love all the, what it has to offer us. What it's missing is preventative care. And also, if you have a chronic problem, taking a medication can be beneficial because as a real master herbalist that's trained, we don't we don't say that anything in the allopathic world is necessarily negative. It has its positives. But whenever someone's taking a medicine for a long period of time, they start to begin to get side effects or the medicine stops working so efficiently. That's why I opened an herbal clinic, because herbal medicine is used, according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, by 80% of people outside the U.S. Botanical herbal medicine has been used for generations. We always had a wise woman or medicine man in our little towns. They would teach people how to use plant-based medicine. And what I love about plant-based medicine is that it's individualized medicine. You're going to laugh. My son's getting a PhD in physics and he was working on research at Mount Sinai and he calls me because, Ma, you're going to love the future of medicine. They're trying to understand and make it individualized medicine. And I had to laugh and I said, well, for 30 years, that's what we do in our office. So just before we go on, if you have a child or you have three children that all, God forbid, have E. coli 
by bacteria and they all get stomach aches from it. One's going to have diarrhea. One may not. One may be nauseous. One may not. One may be throwing up. I hate to be so candid. So even with the same infection we see with children, it can manifest so differently in their bodies. Like two kids getting an ear infection. One has a fever. One literally could go to school, but is snoring at night. So with plant-based botanical medicine, we look at each child, each adult as an individual and come up with an herbal protocol for the way that person manifests their their illnesses or challenges. Oh, I love that. Okay, so I want to ask you lots of questions today about herbs and how they help with winter illnesses. So the colds, the fevers, you know, things like that. But before I ask you those questions, I want to just answer the basics for people. So what are herbs? What are adaptogens? And are they the same thing? So an herb is a category of plant that is edible without toxins or poisons. When we use an herbal medicine, sometimes we use the root, sometimes the stalk, sometimes the leaves, sometimes the seeds, and sometimes the flowers. And sometimes we will combine all of those above together. Each plant has different actions on the body, like certain plants will help if you have thick mucus in your sinuses, whereas another herbal product's gonna help if you have a sore throat. And another herbal product can help if you've got itchy ears and itchy eyes in in the spring and fall allergies. And another herb can give you strength if you're exhausted. So herbs, when an herbalist learns about herbal botanical medicine, and what I love about it is we can teach it to everyone, We learn what is called the action of the herb. Where does it tend to work on the body? If someone's low thyroid, they can take an herb that can help stimulate the thyroid. It's not going to overstimulate it so that it becomes hyper if it's hypo. And it's not like a cup of coffee where you get, you know, kind of wired. It will slowly but surely work on that internal organ or emotional struggle, which we talked about in our last interview. An adaptogen isn't plant that we see doesn't have a specific action like on the kidneys or the liver or the stomach. It tends to help a person handle stress in their whole being. So the adaptogen helps us exactly like the word adapt to our environment of stress. If someone's, God forbid, losing a job or a marriage is breaking up or a kid is not well, people will really benefit from an adaptogen because it will help avoid getting things like migraines, ulcers, indigestion. Whereas a non-adaptogen herb, we're going to give for a specific complaint a person has. That's good to know. So are all adaptogens herbs? Yes, all adaptogens are herbs. Some of them, like schizandra, is a berry. So we consider this, we consider the schizandra plant an herbal plant, but we're using the berries for the, their medicinal properties. Okay, good to know. So now let's talk about illnesses, winter illnesses. Right now, I feel like everyone around me is sick, neighbors and school friends and just everybody we come in contact. It seems like someone's got a cold or a fever or something. So let's talk about prevention of these winter illnesses. Can herbs be preventative to help with these illnesses? Yes. So let's jump to children for a moment. A typical child will get sick five times a winter. Normal. They get a fever. They get a stomach ache. They get a drippy nose. It's actually how they build up their immune system. Their immune system has to have an invader come in. And the immune system has to work and figure out how to fight that infection. So that's completely normal for a child. We don't like when children go from ear infection to bronchiolitis to strep throat back to an ear infection. That's not a high functioning immune system. So what herbs can do for the typical five challenges a winter is lessen the severity of it, have it go away faster, and to let a kid continue to function while the body's fighting that infection. So at the beginning of the school year, 
I especially when kids are going from outside in the sun, playing outside, being in camp, going into the classroom. I like them to take preventatively an herb at least one time a day because we know they're going to be breathing in viruses and bacteria through their nose. When we get a little deeper into the winter, it's a good idea to give it twice a day, morning and evening on the way to school and on the way back from school. And if a child gets sick, and again, we know that kids are going to get sick, we can give the herb three to four times a day. Same with adults. If you're an adult with kids at home, even if you know you went through your magical 20s and 30s not getting sick that much, oh my gosh, your kids are bringing home everything and us parents and adults end up getting it. So really, when, we, when an herbalist takes the history, we have to see what their vulnerability is. But two times a day, at least during these winter months, is ha- what I suggest. Okay, so people I know are wondering, well, what is it that I'm taking? So what herbs do you suggest? So herbs come in many different forms. They come in capsules. They come in tea. Well, actually four. They come in powders and they come in tinctures. So I tend to like tinctures best. For those of you that are just listening, and I'm going to try to explain it to the best that I can. So what we do is we take a plant. And I've got some different colored plants here. Here's a purple plant and a yellow plant. We take the plant. We like it best when it's when it's at its peak as opposed to dry. We pour grain alcohol over it, or we can put a glyceride over it. We keep it in a glass jar covered for six to eight weeks. We strain it, and then we have what is called a tincture. The reason I like to use tinctures is it's quick, it's easy, it's efficient. They come with really small little bottles that you can literally like keep in your backpack. And it's very easy to give to children. So a tincture is an herb that's been processed in. It could be even a vinegar. There's a lot of different ways that we can process it. But right now we're going to say in a grain alcohol. And no, it's not dangerous to give your kids tinctures in a grain alcohol and you can take anywhere from 15 to 45 drops of a tincture diluted in a little bit of juice very quick very easy very efficient but an herb like lemon balm and we're going to get into specific herbs soon lemon balm is in the mint family It's antiviral, it's calming and soothing. It can help some kids that are struggling with some ADD, ADHD. I'm not gonna say it's gonna cure it, but it's definitely helpful. And lemon balm is such a delicious herb that a mother or caregiver can make it into a tea, put it in little ice pops. And if a child gets a fever, you can give them the ice pop of lemon balm, which is cooling for their body and it's got antiviral. So tincture is my go-to just because everyone's on the run, late, overworked, underpaid, working, 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 it's quick and easy. But to have some lemon balm ice pops in your freezer, your kids are gonna love it and it's very medicinal. Okay, good to know. We're going to get to fevers in just a minute, and I'll ask you more about the fevers. But for preventative care, is there a specific herb that you like to give for preventative care? Like you said, when they first start school, give them a drop a day or an herb a day. What would that be? So I love echinacea. Echinacea's got, I mean, it's such a phenomenal herb. It's gotten some bad press. There was a clinical study done years ago. If you want to talk about the study, we can. And they said, oh, it doesn't decrease the severity or the intensity of colds. It doesn't prevent them. Yes, it does. Echinacea is a wonderful herb. It's been used for generations. One of my teacher's is an MD that is Native American. And she said her mother in the beginning when the weather changed in the fall would give a tablespoon of echinacea to all her kids every morning and it would prevent them from getting very ill as the weather was changing. I love echinacea. I love it mixed with elderberry. Elderberry on its own is not, in my experience, powerful enough. It does have some antiviral properties. It's really wonderful because it's it's got a lot of vitamin C in it. I like echinacea mixed with um, elderberry. Um, I also like lemon balm, which we just discussed because it's antiviral and calming and soothing. So you could mix in the same cup 
echinacea, elderberry, and lemon balm. And another herb I love is an herb called andrographis. It's very strong. It's a very potent antiviral. The herb is a little bit bitter, but if you have a child that's getting sick often and seems to pick everything up or an adult, adding some andrographis to that mix is a wonderful idea. Oh, that's good to know. So can you take these herbs every single day and never have to take like a break? Because some people will say, oh, take them for seven days and then you need a break or whatever. I could take these every single day. Yeah, you don't need to take a break. That's for sure not. Because it used to be thought that echinacea was an immune stimulant. But what we really know is that it's an immunomodulator. So even kids or adults that have eczema, where their immune system goes hyper, and then it goes hypo because it stops working, they used to believe that you would overstimulate the immune system with echinacea. But I've never seen that happen. It's an immunomodulator. And what I really see throughout, I mean, I don't want to age myself because I lie about my age, but for the past (laughs) 30 years, what happens is parents, moms, adults, grandparents, caregivers, they really want to give the herb every day. And then they forget for two days. And then they go back to giving it again. Then they forget for three days. So I'm never afraid of people over giving it. I really, I've never seen that. And the one great thing about herbs is let's say you've been giving your kids herbs or yourself every day and you go away for a weekend and you get to this gorgeous resort and you go, oh gosh, I forgot my herbs at home. No problem. You'll be fine. Take that weekend, swim, relax, then go back to giving the herbs herbs. So that's one thing about herbs is you can take them for four days, forget for two, go back and take them for a week, and they'll still constantly work on the body, balancing that immune system. Remember the word is balance. It's not only stimulating, it's balance. I love that. So the herbs are just helping the body stay in balance. Yeah. You know, you you have to think about it this way. You know, we now know like eating lettuce is phenomenally healthy. It helps the intestine stool regularly. It's got anti-inflammatory properties. Like, is anybody worried about having a salad every day? Like, (laughs) will anybody get a negative effect from, you know, having some arugula and iceberg lettuce and romaine lettuce? The answer is no. So it's the same thing with herbs. I mean, if you put some cilantro every day in your soup, great. It's anti-inflammatory. It can reduce lead levels in the body. So I'm just sharing with you that taking herbs every day is only beneficial. It's like having a berry smoothie. It's just going to boost your body's ability to function in our world of chaos. That's a great analogy, how you explained all of that. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about actual cold symptoms, winter illness symptoms. What if we start with coughs? Because My daughter has a cough right now, so let's talk about coughs. Are there different types of coughs out there that different herbs help? Yes. So again, you can have five kids in a house, all have a cough, and one is dry and scratchy. One got so much mucus, they almost sound like they're choking on the mucus. The other one will only be spasmodic at night, and the other one will be like a little tickle in the back of the throat. So yes, when we're treating a cough, we like as herbalists to look at each child, each adult as an individual. But we don't always have the luxury to do that. So you can make an herbal mix, which includes herbs for dry cough, scratchy cough and mucusy cough. So there's an herb called marshmallow, not marshmallow, marshmallow. And they say that that's where we got marshmallow from because marshmallow herb, when you put the root in water, it will make like a white little little fuzzy kind of smushy topping to the top of the cup. And kids used to spoon that off And it was mucilaginous or soothing for the throat or the cough. Hence, they then made marshmallows. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So marshmallow is soothing, scratchy throat, dry throat, dry cough. That's marshmallow. The herb elecampane is for 
excess mucus. Now, sometimes my clients will say my kid's cough is so dry and I'll give them Ella campaign anyways, because Ella campaign helps expectorate mucus. So it will help the body get rid of that mucus. And all of a sudden this very dry cough, especially those lingering dry coughs that kids and adults get in the winter, even though it appears dry repeating, you give them Ella campaign, all of a sudden all this mucus emerges and they start to feel better. So mm. Ella campaign is an expectorant while cherry bark is an herb for that dry cough that dry cough and it will stop the spasming i also give it for wet coughs true confessions so um, while cherry bark is a little bit more for that spasmodic response for the cough so can you put in the same cup ella campaign marshmallow and wild cherry bark absolutely great combination Okay, what about thyme? Does thyme help with coughs as well? I love thyme. Kids tend not to love the taste of thyme, um, but I love thyme. Thyme has essential oils that help actually kill the bacteria or virus inside the lungs. Thyme is phenomenal. It also helps with acne. As a side note, there is a chemical in the thyme that can help with acne. So even though it's considered a cough herb, when I have a client that's a teenager or even adult breaking out, I'll add thyme to it. So yes, you can add thyme because of the essential oil and its antibacterial, antiviral co components with all the above spoken herbs. Absolutely. Okay, so do these herbs, the wild cherry bark, the marshmallow, all of those, are they antiviral herbs? Is that why they're helping or are they just soothing the symptoms and not really doing anything for the illness? All these plants that we've spoken about, except for marshmallow, do have antiviral properties in them. Ella campaign has antibacterial and antiviral properties, and so does wild cherry bark. So yes, we're always trying to treat the, the cause rather than just treating the symptoms. I mean, sometimes if someone has a toothache, my goodness, go take an Advil, take a Tylenol, <laughs> put some diluted clove oil around your tooth, wait till you get to a dentist. So very often we want to palliate symptoms. That means get rid of the symptoms without getting to the root of it, because maybe you need that root canal or you need some kind of dental work going on. But as herbalists, we really want to treat what is the root cause that's going on here. Yes. Okay. Good to know. What about those tickles in the back of your throat? What herb is good for that? So that's where marshmallow would come in. And I want to jump and sneak in a little homeopathic remedy. Homeopathy is the little ballies you put under your tongue, arnica, other remedies like that. So there's a homeopathic remedy called Rumex, R-U-M-E-X, that is really good to have in the house at 30C because it really helps with that tickle in the back of the throat. And that kid or husband or partner that's keeping you up all night with that little, eh, eh, <laughs> just give them some Rumex and you'll get some sleep. Okay. I asked you that because that's my daughter right now. She's like, oh, I've got this tickle in the back of my throat all night long. So good to yes. know. Okay, these herbs that you're talking about, do people just go on Amazon to find them if they don't have an herbalist that they see? Where is the best place to find these? Well, there are certain companies that I really like and trust. And I don't know that I would buy my herbs at like CVS or Walgreens, not putting down CVS or Walgreens. They have great products. Um, but there are herbalists that make products that we know are top quality. So when you want to use a product, I really suggest that you call the company and ask if a master herbalist is overseeing the production. And most companies will have what people don't understand is a chemist sitting there checking each batch for lead, pesticides, any other impurities, and making sure that the genus, the herb is what they say it is. And I want to give an example. So let's say I'm producing herbs and I want to make a batch of kava. Kava is a root 
plant. We use the root. It grows in the Philippines and it helps you go to sleep, helps with muscle aches and can relax our overstressed bodies. So let's say they send me a batch of kava and I look at the kava because I'm a master herbalist. I'm like, oh, it's a little too dry. I think they kept it in the ground too long or they didn't, they didn't store it properly. There's not a lot of the essential oils left. I don't want this batch of kava, right? So I'm going to send it back to the company. Now, the people that produce that kava, they're not going to lose money on it. They'll sell it at 50% off to the next buyer, right? So you want to make sure there's an herbalist part of the company you're buying herbs from because we're not going to settle for second best. Like I'd rather pay a little bit more for an herb and know that it's really a rose from Bulgaria as opposed to a rose from like, you know, Culver City, California. I love Culver City. I'm just giving an example because Bulgarian roses are the top in the world. So I'm just giving an example that you can call companies and make sure that there's an herbalist overseeing the production. Okay, that's really good to know. Let's move on to another symptom of winter illnesses, and that's fevers. So fevers scare a lot of parents, but actually fevers can be a good thing. So I'm assuming there's herbs out there that help fevers. I'm wondering what those herbs are, but at what point do you give these herbs? Because probably some of them lower the fevers. And do we always want to lower the fever? So, of course, I have to say that this show is an educational show and go see your doctor if you're concerned about a fever, obviously. Right. So we're going to talk about the parent or caregiver who is absolutely responsible. Okay. So fevers are really good because the brain will read a bacteria or a virus in the body and the brain will decide at what level of heat this bacteria or virus can be gotten rid of in the body. So when the child's fever goes up and we give a Tylenol or Advil to lower it, the brain is like, whoa, I wanted to set the fever at 102. 1.1, but the bacteria or virus is still there. Let's go ahead and try 102.3. The fever starts going up again. The loving caregiver gives Tylenol or Advil, lowers the fever, and the bacteria or virus is still there. So again, the rules are, if it's above 105, go to the hospital. If your child can't turn their neck to the right or the left, they have a stiff neck, God forbid it could be meningitis, go to the hospital. Let's be logical. But most kids can go from 101 to 104, back to 101, back to 104. As long as they're drinking fluids, they don't need to eat, you're good to go. And I want them to be conscious and looking at you and able to communicate. Yes, they can sleep a lot. Okay, we're being very good caregivers, but there are herbs that can actually keep the fever where it needs to be, but act as a refrigerant to cool the body down. Hmm. So there's an herb called elderflower, not elderberry, elderflower, the flowers before the berry grows, which is a refrigerant which will cool the body down so the child feels better while having the fever. Another herb I love is called yarrow. Yarrow will help a child perspire more. And we want that fever to be there. We don't want the fever to go down to 98.6 if they're still sick. But yarrow will help a child perspire more. A lot of kids don't perspire that much. So they can keep the heat, perspire to keep it high enough that it needs to be, but the child feeling comfortable. And then there's another herb called catnip which is also for cough. That might be a good idea for that scratchy throat cough. And catnip calms kids and adults down when they're having a fever and make them feel more comfortable. So mm. those are three herbs, elderflower, yarrow, and catnip that can you mix them all together? Of course you can. And that's a great fever mix to have in the house. And again, you just recommend taking all of these as a tincture? I do, again, Catnip, if you buy it in glycerite or make it into a tea, is another good idea that you can make into ice pops. We spoke about lemon balm. It's also for, fe for fevers, lemon balm. And you can make some lemon balm and catnip if your children 
love ice pops. If they're over a year old, you can add some honey. If they're under a year, you can add some maple syrup, make it sweet, and they can suck on those little ice pops and feel better with their fevers and stay hydrated. The most important thing is to stay hydrated with a fever. And if a mother's overwhelmed, the caregiver's overwhelmed, I don't know if anybody can relate to that, then giving it in tincture form is just easy. It's just, here's a little tincture, a couple drops in a little bit of grape juice, boom, boom, and the kid has it in their tummy. So can I do like a couple drops of catnip and a couple drops of elderflower and a couple drops of yarrow? I can just do a combination of them all, right? Yes. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. In my book, Moodtopia, even though my book, Moodtopia, which is available on Amazon, is basically an herb, a, a book on herbs for moods, which we've discussed before. But I have in the back and I discuss lemon balm and catnip because they they calm our mind down and are also antiviral. So I speak very specifically about how to use herbs um, in a very safe way. But the answer is yes, you can mix all those herbs together. If you're a beginner, you can get herbal combinations by master herbalists like myself, where we will combine anywhere from like four to seven herbs. If you're looking at an herbal product and it's got 20 herbs in it, like don't take it. It's too many. Like I always tell my clients that an herb mix is kind of like a jazz band, right? We've got a little saxophone. We got a little drums, a little keyboard. They kind of work in this great symbiotic relationship together. We don't need a hundred instruments. We need four or five. So the same thing with herbs, anywhere from two herbs to eight herbs is about the limit that I mix herbs. Herbs. Okay. And when we do these tinctures, do they have to go in juice or can we just put the tinctures directly in their mouth? So if it's in a glycerite, a glycerite is a sugar based extraction. So it's sweet. So you can get lemon balm and linden, which is another good fever herb and catnip in a glycerite. And you could put it directly in the kid's mouth. I don't want them putting their mouth on the dropper and then reinfecting the bottle. But when we're talking about echinacea or elecampane, they're going to work better because there's a root to them. There's harder to break down in an alcohol. And it's usually a little bit better if you dilute it in a grape juice apple juice or cranberry juice. And the herbs can be a little bit bitter. One thing I say I love is that, I don't know if you know that when Tylenol first came out, it was in bubble gum, it was in cherry, grape flavored. There were more rehospitalizations for kids with liver damage because the moms would say, okay, no more candy, no more candy. And kids who are brilliant would climb up, get the Tylenol, even the child proof, they would open it up and they would drink that bubble gum. So the one thing about herbs I love is you're never going to have a kid that's going to OD on it. <laughs> Your kid is not going to say, oh my gosh, I'm going to go get that Ella campaign because it's a bitter herb. So we don't have kids that, that take too much of the plant. We give them 10 drops, eight drops, 15 drops, and it's just enough. Okay. Yeah. I remember those days of Tylenol. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious, does peppermint help with fevers? So peppermint essential oil is another great tool. So what we do with peppermint essential oil is you dilute it in a little bit of lotion. You can use an almond oil. You could just use your hand lotion, put a couple drops of the peppermint. You can massage it into your child's feet and back and it will cool them down when they have a fever and help them sleep and be able to want to drink more because we want to keep them hydrated. So peppermint essential oil. Um, I was trained very strictly that we don't put essential oils in our mouths. We don't ingest them because they're just too concentrated. And when people take oregano oil internally, they do open themselves up for an ulcer or burning the esophagus. So with essential oils, my training is we put it topically on the body, diluted peppermint or spearmint really makes kids with fevers feel much better. And they'll ask for it. They're like, mommy, put that on my back again. Cause it's just this cooling sensation. Okay. So what about then like peppermint teas? You can definitely do peppermint teas. And if your kids like the taste of peppermint, some kids do, some kids do not. You could add, if we're making our ice pops again, lemon balm with peppermint, make it into an ice. Catnip and peppermint, make it into an ice. And anytime you can even make an ice peppermint, even in the middle of cold weather, and they could also drink that. So peppermint helps with digestion, 
very soothing. Okay, what about chamomile? Because I'm asking you this because you see on the store shelves all the time for colds and fevers, things like that, the chamomile teas and the peppermint teas. So that's why I'm asking. Sure. So chamomile, you just always have to be a teeny bit weary. If your kid or you have spring allergies, it is in the ragweed family. So I always want people to know that if it's a very allergic family every spring and fall, itchy eyes, stuffy nose, it could be that chamomile would not be my first choice. But chamomile, and I want to say this because it's so amazing, the flowers are this beautiful yellow. They're a vibrant yellow. But when you crush chamomile, the essential oil is blue. It's fascinating. I mean, it's like to see chamomile being made into an essential oil. I mean, you just sit there and go, oh my gosh, how did that happen? Is it a magic trick? So chamomile is a wonderful herb. It's a wonder. And chamomile tea is calming, soothing, can help you go to sleep when you have a flu, can help you feel better when you have a flu. If you're going to take a medicinal um, amount of chamomile, it's not just one tea bag with hot water. You have to put like three tea bags in there. You need the chamomile to get a little bit thick and yellow. If a child's over a year old, an adult, you add some honey to it. Chamomile is very soothing, very calming, and can help with viruses and infections. Love it. I'm just always a little hesitant without reminding people that it can't. There are few people that are allergic, but like with elderflower never really had anybody allergic to it. Lemon balm, never really had, but I love chamomile. So I'm glad you brought it up. Okay. So with all of these herbs for these coughs, for these fevers, can even little babies take this? Because I know the kids can, can babies and can pregnant women. So again, I'm an international board certified lactation consultant, and I actually guest lecture at medical schools um, on breastfeeding and herbs and teach conferences. Babies all over the world have been given herbs for generations and generations. People, the midwives of old, always in their emergency bags, had a lot of herbs for moms. If they started bleeding, they'd use shepherd per, shepherd's purse and yarrow. If a child, you know, had a stuffy nose, they would use elderflower. So herbs are used with children and babies. Again, for babies, I'd rather someone work with an herbalist just to learn. And I just want to, you know, share with you and your listeners that Herbalists, when you work with an herbalist, our goal is to teach the caregivers and parents to be independent. I don't need you to be addicted to me. My goal, every time you come to a consult, I'm going to teach you about another herb. I'm going to teach you about something else you can have. Like we're, we're kind of terrible business people because we really want you to know your own little first aid kit, right? We want to empower you to be able to use what is called plant medicine for everyone. And we can teach people how to grow three herbs on their windowsill, fire escape, porch, or backyard. And then you can begin to work with the herbs. When it comes to babies, I'd rather you work with a professional like me. And I also want to make sure the product is top notch, not secondary. So that's the answer with kids. We do it all the time. All the time, babies are administered herbs. Sometimes babies, a couple of weeks old, they have this stuffy nose. And when they go to breastfeed, their ears are popping because their nose is so stuffy. Of course, we want to clear up their nose. Sometimes kids have indigestion. We give them some fennel tea. They're better able to digest either the formula or mother's milk. So there's a lot of herbs we do. When it comes to older children, as long as it's a good product herb and, and the caregiver is educated, start with five drops can go up to eight or 10 drops. You can really experiment as long as it's a good quality and we're giving non-toxic herbs. I'm glad you said all of that. I used herbs with my little babies as newborns when they were having a hard time digesting the breast milk. So I love that you say it's totally fine. So, but you did talk about stuffy noses and congestion. And so I am curious, are there certain herbs that you like for congestion? Yes, of course. There's herbs for everything. Um, and there's an herb called Yerba Santa 
not such a popular herb. It's a little bit bitter, true confessions, but Yerba Santa thins the mucus in a phenomenal way. So if I have a kid that comes in, you know, those green noses that always stick, those kids that always have crust, you're like such a handsome guy, wipe his nose. You know <laughs> what I mean? Yerba Santa is phenomenal for that. I also love the medicinal mushroom called Rishi. Rishi is also an immunomodulator and Rishi helps a lot with these stuffy noses. They're like phenomenal. So Rishi with Yerba Santa and the other herb I'm going to mention, and I know we're going really fast with these herbs, but I just want people to start to understand and hear, oh, I've heard of Yerba Santa. Oh, I've heard of these herbs. So the next herb is an herb called Eyebright. Eyebright is an endangered herb. We're not supposed to pick it too much in the U.S., but my philosophy is everybody stop picking it. So there's some left for me because <laughs> I love it. It gets rid of the fluid in the ears. So kids that have chronic fluid in their ears, it will actually reabsorb the fluid in the eustachian tubes and also help with that chronically drippy nose. So a little Rishi mixed with a little Yerba Santa mixed with a little Eyebright. And after a couple weeks, you're going to have a kid with a much, I'm not talking acute, like if you have a kid acutely, they'll get better. But I'm talking those kids even with chronic stuffy noses. After a couple weeks on these herbs, you're going to see like almost remarkably excitingly, the nose will be less drippy. Will it also help those with acute issues? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking chronic because I was thinking of that poor little kid with the crusty nose and the crusty eyes. But yes, it will help acutely. If a kid, look, here's this in herbal medicine. If a kid didn't have a stuffy nose on a Monday, got one on a Tuesday, I want it gone by Thursday. Oh. If a kid has had a chronic drippy nose, it can take a couple of weeks or months to get rid of it. But yes, all these herbs work in acute. Acute means comes on suddenly. Chronic means it's been there for more than three months. Okay. I'm glad you answered that because my daughter right now has the congestion. So that's why I asked you. So thank you so much. Um, but you did talk about the ears and fluid to the ears. So now I want to move on to ear infections because I'm sure there are so many herbs that can help that. Too many parents just run and go get on an antibiotic. And then a lot of times the ear infections aren't even bacterial to begin with. So what are your thoughts on ear infections and herbs? Well, again, each person's going to be individual and we need to figure out where it's coming from. Is it allergic? Is it viral? Is it just an inflammatory response that didn't go away? So under age five, kids don't have the core muscles, the stomach muscles to blow their nose yet. Try to teach a three-year-old to blow their nose. They just can't do that. <laughs> They put it on their mouth. They can't blow their nose. So what happens is when kids get a stuffy nose, they <laughs> inhale. They're constantly inhaling. And what happens is that nose is go that that mucus is going up the nose and it can go right into the eustachian tubes. So very often with ear infections, also there's certain food sensitivities. And if we take out certain herbs in a child's diet, the ear infections will stop coming. So I also want to point out about tubes in the ears. I mean, no one should out there feel guilty if they put tubes. I mean, like what we do to help our kids and survive, we, you know, we get applauded for. But when you put tubes in the ears, it just makes a bridge and takes the mucus from point A and pushes it through to point C. It's still not getting rid of it. So that's why even a lot of kids that, that were getting chronic ear infections have tubes in their ears. They turn around and start to get chronic strep throat or chronic stomach aches because the mucus is still there. So we want to find the impetus, what is going on. Sometimes, very simply, you can take your child's pillow throw it in the dryer, get rid of the dust mites. Don't wash them because then they get all deformed. Just put them in the dryer for 20 minutes on high, get rid of the dust mites, put an allergy free pillowcase. You can buy them online over your pillow with your regular pillowcase on top because when kids are sleeping and they have a stuffy nose, they turn their head to the right and they get all the dust mites from the pillow up their nose. It's going to creep into the nose, keep that chronic mucus, get that chronic fluid in the ears. They turn their head to the left. They've got still dust mites inhaling. And remember when you have a stuffy nose, the mucus is like flypaper, like everything will stick to it, viruses, bacteria. 
That's why we want to right away when a kid gets a drippy nose, we're like, how can we treat this? How can we treat this stuffy nose before it drips down the back of the throat and makes a cough, goes into the eustachian tubes, gets a chronic response where it's, you know, trapping all these dust mites. So back to the pillow. Sometimes one of the important steps, not that a person's not clean, but houses can be dusty. I mean, my goodness, I live in Brooklyn, New York. It is completely dusty no matter how many times you clean. So getting an allergy-free pillowcase on kids' pillows is a good step to stop that chronic fluid in the ears or the chronic stuffy nose. Taking out a couple food items um, can also make a big difference. And starting those herbs two to three times a day can really help the body rebalance itself. Our bodies are a self-healing mechanism. We see that if we're in the kitchen and we cut our finger peeling a potato and, oh my gosh, we really should put antibiotic cream on it, but we're so busy. And the next day you're like, oh, wow, thank God that already healed because our body constantly wants to rebalance itself. It's the way it was created. So some of those foods that you're talking about that maybe they should take away if they've got chronic ear infections, are you talking maybe dairy and gluten? Well, I, my training because a lot of my teachers were from Japan, China, and Korea. Although I'm a Western herbalist, I like to hear what's going on out there. So I believe a lot about blood typing. So I've seen over 30 years that A's respond differently than B's, B's respond differently than O's, O's respond differently than AB's. So usually I look at the child or adult's blood type and choose to take out certain foods. So for instance, blood type Bs have a chemical called lactase to break down lactose. And shockingly, a lot of blood type Bs that have these chronic ear infections, they've been off of dairy for a year and they come into me and say, didn't help. I'm not doing gluten. I'm not doing dairy. And I still have a problem. And it's strange, but blood type Bs don't do well with chicken and avocados. So I say, okay, let's go off chicken and avocados back on dairy. They're like, what? You've lost your mind, Sarah Khan. I'm like, well, maybe a little, but let's try it. And they go off avocado, which is a perfect food for some people. They go off chicken and their ears start clearing up. So that's why is dairy produced well? You're the expert on that. Are our cows treated well? I'm going to leave that to you. I mean, that's a whole nother discussion. Right. But it could be that a lot of kids getting really, you know, living on a farm can eat dairy and be fine. So it's really kind of controversial when we get into that dairy gluten. It's just hard. Like, okay. it's funny because I, Sarahana, don't do well with wheat in America. But when I travel overseas... And, you know, when you're traveling, you kind of grab a sandwich a lot more than I would in, in, in the States. Sometimes in other countries, the wheat just doesn't bother me as much. So, ugh, tricky. It's, I mean, you're, you know, I, I was, not all products are created equal. You are the, the, the expert on that. I was going to say I could do a whole podcast on why you can eat that wheat in other countries rather than here in America. Lots Absolutely. of differences. So, yeah, lots of differences. Okay, so let's talk, though, about just the kid that gets that one ear infection because they had a cold and then they got this ear infection. Are there certain herbs you would recommend that can help heal it, help with the pain? What do you suggest? Yeah, for sure. That's for sure. So going over all the herbs that we've discussed, um, I would like echinacea because it's an immunomodulator. I would put some elderflower because it's got natural antihistamine properties to it. I would put some reishi in there and I'd probably put a little yarrow. Those four herbs given three to four times a day will help incredibly with that ear pain. You can also take an essential oil diluted and put behind the ear, not in the ear, because unless you can look inside the ear, we want to make sure that there's no leakage, that we don't have a busted eardrum. You can massage it around the exterior of the air. And another thing that's amazing during pain is you take an onion, you cut it in half, you put it in the oven, heat it up. Mother caregiver has to put their finger to make sure it's not too hard. We're not burning a child. And you put it either in a cheesecloth, an old nylon, a pillowcase, put a towel on the kid's um, pillow. I don't want you getting onion juice everywhere. And letting that kid lay up with the warm onion against their ear with an herb inside their body works phenomenally well. 
Do you know what? I heard that trick probably, oh, 14 years ago when I had littles. Well, I still have a couple littles, but I was shocked. It works every time for ear infections. And sometimes when we would do that onion trick, um, after a couple hours, there would be like mucus and just junk that had come out of the ear that was sitting on top of the onion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's just so easy, you know, just make sure it's not too hot for your child, but it works really well. And I think one of the most important things I learned from one of my herbal teachers was that when a child gets sick, we really have forgotten about that convalescent time. Like, you know, a kid gets strep throat, you go to a doctor, boom, they go on an antibiotic and the next day you're sending the kid back to school. Really? Sometimes kids need one or two days to recover watch some videos, be in their parents' bed all coddled up, stay in pajamas. So sometimes when a child gets sick, they also just need a day or two off. I mean, we're like, really? How hard is kindergarten? Have you ever tried to go to my job? Or you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, really? Sixth grade? Wait till you get to ninth grade. But sometimes kids, when they get sick, they just need a couple days at home, eating some warm oatmeal with some maple syrup, maybe a little foot massage with some peppermint oil or spearmint oil. So I think that's an important thing that just when the child's better, still give them another day to recover so they don't go back into the classroom and pick up the next virus that is p getting passed around. Right. That day of rest or a couple days of rest, I think is really important. Can I ask you about one other topic with winter illnesses? I know a lot of people like when they have the sore throats or the coughs, the congestion, you know, any of those things, they have a hard time sleeping at night. And so sleep is so important to get over the illness, but at the same time, they're battling being able to sleep well. So what would you suggest for sleep in those cases? So that's a really good point. Um, hard, when your nose is stuffy, your throat is hurting, you sleep with your mouth open if you have a stuffy nose and your already a sore throat is even drier. So that's when I really like to diffuse some essential oils in the room, especially with kids. You can get cold diffusers. They're so inexpensive online. You plug them in, you can get them for 10 bucks um, and you can diffuse eucalyptus oil. You can diffuse thyme oil. You can diffuse cypress. There's so many amazing um, essential oils. Just a couple drops in a diffuser can open up your nose, dry your throat if it's bothering you. If you don't want to deal with a diffuser because you have a kid that's going to knock it over or your husband doesn't like or your partner the smell of it. You can literally, don't get an expensive pillowcase, but just a regular pillowcase. You can just put a couple drops of the essential oil right around your pillowcase. So huh. you move to the right, you smell it. Move to the left, you smell it in. If you don't really want to get it on your pillowcase, you can take an old towel, put one on either side of the pillow with a bunch of essential oils and it'll still, you know, you can still breathe it in. So that's a really good idea chamomile tea, which we discussed, is a phenomenal idea to have a chamomile tea, not right before you go to bed, because then you're going to wake up an hour later having to go to the bathroom, but maybe an hour and a half before you go to sleep. And I would be taking some sleep herbs, which we didn't discuss yet. Here's another list of herbs. We have passion flower, which is wonderful, calming and soothing, and you don't wake up feeling over sedated. Linden, which I just touched upon earlier, helps with stomach indigestion, helps with fevers, calming and soothing when you have a flu. And back to lemon balm, lemon balm, antiviral, calming and soothing. So these herbs are great to take. If you're having trouble sleeping and you get into bed at one o'clock, taking it at five to one may not work as well as you want it to. So if you know you're have, having trouble sleeping, taking these herbs around dinner time retaking them again around eight or nine, and then retaking them around 11, 12 before you go to bed. So they're in the system calming you down before you go to sleep. Because we could do a whole show on sleep issues, of course. Yes, we could. But a lot of us get into bed, 
oh my gosh, I forgot to do this. You're making your list. You're checking your phone. You're thinking about what you want to do tomorrow. You're thinking about what your cousin said three weeks ago on a Tuesday that really offended you, but you never said anything. So our brains can cycle and cycle and cycle and cycle before we go to bed. So that's why herbalists suggest taking the herbs two or three times so that it's starting to calm your brain down before you go to bed. And sometimes just an hour before you go to bed, making a list of everything you need to do tomorrow, you didn't do last week, you want to do three weeks from now, just sitting and writing that list an hour before you go to bed, then folding it up, putting it in an envelope. Don't do it on your phone. I want it on paper and say, I already dealt with this. I don't need to deal with this when I get into bed. And then you can go and try to focus in on sleeping with that cold flu headache or your partner snoring. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you are just such a wealth of information. I would love to have you again and have people write in like health concerns that they have that they would want to know more about with herbs and things because herbs can really benefit all different health issues out there, right? It's called people's medicine. For thousands of years, our local midwives taught everybody about these herbal plants. Now, I do want to say that, again, if you break your leg, please go to the hospital, get an x-ray, get a cast. But I always tell the story. We were in upstate New York in a beautiful bungalow where my kids could freely run around like crazy maniacs. By the way, I'm a mom of seven. I have a girl, five boys and a girl. Oh, wow. So my house was crazy. You have a very busy house also. And my daughter was like two and a half, three. She broke her arm and she was put in a cast. And the the doctor was like, well, this is going to be a crappy summer for your daughter. She's got to have this cast on. She's so little for at least two and a half months. So of course I got the cast and I started giving her herbs and homeopathy. Four weeks later, I went back and he took the x-ray and he crossed his arms like this and said, you know, the arm looks healed. I'm so hesitant to take the cast off, but it looks like a three months later. And I was smiling to myself going, <laughs> ooh, those herbs. So he said, give it one more week. And we gave it one more week and we came back and he said, never done this before, but I'm going to take off this cast. So here's the proof that herbs can help the body heal faster. It helped that bone knit together. And so, of course, Always go and get stitches if your child needs stitches. Go to the doctor, get a diagnosis. But even with stitches, there's essential oils and herbs we can put over when the stitches come out to prevent there being a scar. So I like to think about it as integrative medicine, com complementary medicine. It's not just being extreme and being an herbalist. It's using our x-ray and MRIs and then using the herbs. And they work beautifully together. And that's what I want your listeners to understand. It's not one or the other. It's both. I love that. That's what I love so much about you. So I know I have a lot of listeners that are like, okay, I need to find an herbalist because I know very, very little about herbs. And this sounds amazing. Herbs can really help. So do you take new clients or where do people find an herbalist? So you can reach out to me either on Instagram. You can personal message me there at Sarahana S S A R A C H A N A S or my website, which is moodtopiabook.com. And you can send me a message. I do Skype with people all over the world. If you want to meet someone personally, there is call, something called the AHG, which is the American Herbalist Guild. And you can put in your state or city and they'll give a list of herbalists that are in your area. It's hard to become an AHG herbalist. You can't just do a weekend Instagram course on it. You need to have practiced for over 10 years, oh, seen wow. thousands of patients. You really have to be well educated. So that's also a good resource. Um, there are a lot of good books out there, including my book, Moodtopia. And I think it's very important to start to be educated, start to read, start to understand about it. Yeah, that's all really good advice. So do you sell your own herbs or no? So I don't sell herbs. I sell knowledge. I can always refer people. I know you also have a lot of good products up 
on your site, you know, you look them up, you research them like I would, but people can always reach out to me and ask me my opinion. I don't represent any herbal companies, but some are better than others. So I'm more than happy to share what I would use with my own children. Now, when I'm in upstate New York, I will make my own herbs for my family, but I live in Brooklyn. I'm not picking the herbs that are growing on the streets here, but it's interesting. I do do herbal walks in Brooklyn. We're in the spring. We walk around this crowded, crazy city. We go through alleyways and I show people all the medicinal herbs that are growing through the cracks of the concrete. And that's very empowering. And everybody may find that in their area. You can look up weed walk. It's not marijuana walk. It's called a medicinal (laughs) weed walk. And it's really fun to see what's growing in your neighborhood. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. And then For this episode, you are going to maybe type up a thing about all the different herbs that we've talked about so people can just print it out, right? Yes. So what I would love to give to your listeners, they can reach out to me either on Instagram at Sarahana S or through my email, moodtopiabook.com. And if you say you're a Just Ingredients listener, then I am making up a little paper that talks about the herbs that we've discussed that you can print and put right on your refrigerator as a quick, easy resource. What a great resource. That is so nice of you. I'll need that resource myself. Absolutely. Um, Will you also just tell my listeners about your book? Because I found your book to be fascinating. And so will you just tell them a little bit about what it is? Sure. So I wrote a book called Moodtopia. Um, When I was first writing a book, I was like, should I do it about kids' health? Should I do it about allergies? And then I said, oh, my gosh, everybody struggles with sadness Happiness can even be a struggle, feeling overwhelmed, feeling depressed, people that have a broken heart, people that feel stuck in sadness, people that have waves of depression. Now, you don't have to be depressed all the time, but something can happen in your life. You can lose a job. A loved one could, God forbid, get ill. And you just feel in this bind. You don't feel like you need psychotropic meds, but you feel like you need some hand-holding And that's where Moodtopia comes in because it talks about all the herbs that are available for us for very inexpensive, very easy to use. And these are herbs that we can also give it through to our teenage kids. Oh my gosh, teenage kids get bullied. They get bullied all the time. They get nervous. They get overwhelmed. They fall in love with someone. They don't love them back. So even for teenagers and toddlers, all of us that go through emotional challenges, there are herbs here to help us. I love that. For those listening, her book is amazing. I highly recommend it. Thank you so much for being here on the show today. Like I said, you are just a wealth of knowledge, such an amazing resource. So I really appreciate you taking the time to educate myself and my listeners. And before um, we wrap up, I always ask my guests what they have found to be the best ingredient in life. What would you say it is? I would say it's knowledge. Knowledge is power. And I want to give one example. I just, because I'm a lactation consultant, I had a woman in my office that had just given birth and she had for nine months been with the same OB. She saw him every month for the first eight months. Then she saw him weekly. So I was doing an experiment and I said, can you tell me three things that your doctor taught you about in your pregnancy? And she sits there and says, I said, just three things, three insights. And the answer was none. So at the end of our consult, which was an hour and a half, I said to her, can you tell me five things you learned about your body, your baby, your health? And she said, Sarah Khanna, five things. I could tell you 25 things I learned. So when we as human beings get knowledge and wisdom, it just empowers us to do what we want to in the world. So gather that knowledge. A little bit of information can go a long way. I absolutely love that. I don't know if anyone has said knowledge as the best ingredient. And I really agree because the more you learn, the more you can empower yourself to make the best choice for you and your health and you and your family's health. So I really love that. And that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing with your site. You're educating us on 
Don't use this product, substitute it with this. Why don't you try this? Look into that. That's exactly what you're doing is you're giving that knowledge and that power to people to make their own decisions. You're not making it for them. You're sharing that knowledge so they can make it. And that's why I applaud your work also. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. That's a very nice compliment. And again, thank you for being here. I know you're busy, but you are just an amazing resource. And I so appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to the Just Ingredients podcast to learn more about your health and good ingredients to life. Plus, get daily tips at just.ingredients on Instagram.